Hello, hello, hello. So let's now take a look at some of uh, the potential paper two uh, essay questions for the micro part of the course. So this is of course section A of this paper two. Uh, so let's uh, get stuck into what we've seen here. Now, of course, this list isn't going to be exhaustive. You need to do your wider reading, make sure that you're well rehearsed in um, many of the other areas. But these uh, questions, I believe, have probably got the highest potential of being in uh, this week's paper. So let's take a look. All right, so let's start off with a bit of theory of the firm, the business economics part of the course. Uh, so it's it's been a little while since we've uh, really had much on oligopolies in the paper two. Uh, now that said, of course, we've seen this uh, sort of questioning appear in the paper one last week. Okay, so that does diminish the actual chance of oligopolies appearing, but nevertheless, it's actually worth just making sure that you understand the difference between collusive oligopolies, formerly collusive oligopolies, and implicitly collusive oligopolies, so more competitive markets where they use, say, price matching, price guarantees, and so on. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, it, it's, it could still figure. It's less likely, though, having seen the case study from uh, Thursday. Uh, so next one, all firms pursue short-term profit maximization, evaluate the statement. So something on aims of firms, there's there's a decent likelihood of this one. It's been a while since uh, we've seen a question on this. So yeah, there's, there's a good chance there. Okay, so make sure you're uh, really clued up on your aims of firms. Okay, you know your behavioral, you know your managerial behavior. Uh, behavior. Uh, within firms. Okay, so really important stuff. Of course, we've seen a big rise in ethics, corporate social responsibility. So these types of issues do fit in with this wider point regarding uh, simple profit maximization. And notice this question specifies short term profit maximization. maximization. Uh, and then you can break these sections down like all firms. Is that true of all market structures? Uh, what would happen, say, for instance, in a perfectly competitive market if they didn't pursue short-term profit maximization? Uh, would that market operate quite as efficiently? Um, next one, perfect competition results in a far greater uh, level of efficiency than that of uh, monopoly. Evaluate the statement. So there, there could be a comparative question between uh, perfect competition and uh, monopoly. Uh, so just asking you to consider the different dynamics of these markets and really demonstrate your understanding of those three key efficiencies. So that is, of course, productive, allocative, and dynamic efficiencies. Okay, so really important. Uh, you are hot to trot on those. Okay, all right, let's move it on. Uh, how about this then? So rapid improvements in technology have continued disrupt market structures. Uh, so there's been a lot of new disruptive firms entering a variety of different markets. Think about, say, for instance, Airbnb. Uh, think about Uber and the way in which that's di disrupted traditional markets uh, of sort of bed and breakfast or hotels and uh, taxi firms. Okay, uh, but to what extent has that actually changed market structures there? Uh, so that's another interesting one. I mean, when it comes to um, Uber, you could be arguing that uh, for the actual firms themselves, the individual drivers, uh, it's a more perfectly competitive market because you're not so worried what type of car you get in, uh, perhaps, all right. Um, however, uh, when it comes to Airbnb, it's more monopolistic. But then at the other end of the spectrum, those big companies, Uber and uh, Airbnb, do exhibit some practices of monopoly-based uh, market structures. Okay, so let's move it on to market failure. What have we got here? Uh, so, uh, like, you know, we, we've seen this plastic bag charge, but this could just as easily be something about the sugar tax or um, the need to actually curb... Uh, consumption of plastic okay so that's a, a, another interesting angle and just on that point when it comes to the um, uh, plastic point it's just worth understanding that in some developing countries there is a need for greater levels of plastic to actually um, increase the actual uh, the lifetime of uh, 
perishable products such as uh, fresh produce, okay, fresh food produce. So uh, it's not necessarily the case that it's a problem in all areas, but there is this problem in disposal and recycling, of course. Anyway, let's come back to this. Um, so the plastic bag charge has reduced consumption greatly. This illustrates the importance of intervention to correct all externalities, okay? Um, so this is very, very broad. Many of these questions are in paper two, of course. Um, now, the plastic bag charge does have numerous unintended consequences. We know this is being... Uh, uh, doubled so it's not just going to be 5p it's going to be 10p um, really the the charge itself is is just a tiny fee and that fits well with behavioral economics that is a little nudge towards actually just making better decisions um, yeah however moving it up to 10p is that really necessary given that that has actually been very very effective and just on the unintended consequences when it comes to uh, developing the other types of uh, bags for life or whatever you call them you know the rattan sort of wicker materials they're sometimes made from uh, the energy needed to produce those goods is far, far higher than just a simple plastic bag. So was it really necessary about having a charge or should we have actually had a better means of disposing of plastic bags rather than uh, most people uh, just stowing them away under, uh, under the sink or whatever? Uh, so there we go. Right. What else have we got here? Um, so rising inequality. Again, it's been a little while since inequality has featured. Now, there's a chance this could feature in the Section A and the Section B macro part. Okay, so uh, I've put down two different uh, alternative ways here that this could appear. Rising inequality is the most damaging of all market failures. Evaluate this statement or to what extent should intervention take place to address income inequality. Uh, okay, so there have been some issues, uh, and some of these issues, of course, have been caused by increased globalization and structural unemployment, uh, but you need to be aware of uh, different policy methods that can be used to actually correct uh, income inequality, and try to be uh, quite original in the sort of points that you can actually generate here. So, of course, progressive taxation's uh, a, uh, a biggie here, but that's that's rather sort of unoriginal. What else can we also offer? Well, other suggestions could be uh, that regressive forms of taxation, such as uh, perhaps even VAT, uh, could be actually reduced, and uh, wealth. Uh, uh, wealth taxes could be introduced on um, very, very high value properties. That's an area that's been touted, for instance. Other potential options could in include increasing the uh, child uh, to adult ratio in uh, nurseries to actually make work uh, or make childcare that much uh, less expensive and make work that much more rewarding. Uh, so there's a, a variety of different uh, ways that you could actually address income inequality and uh, trying to improve this. But you could also be looking at, of course, what I believe is the most important element, equality of opportunity. OK, um, so public goods. Again, this has been a little while since we've seen anything on public goods. Now, notice this, uh, this term here is not um, actually differentiating between pure public goods and quasi-public goods here, okay? So you would want to make sure that you show that. Um, so should all public goods uh, be provided by the government? Well, quite blatantly, no, okay? Because there's numerous problems in doing so, okay? Uh, but when it comes to pure public goods, we've often seen that actually the government is likely to be most effective when it comes to those. But to what extent should they be providing uh, quasi-public goods, things like healthcare, education, and so on, okay? So that that's uh, a far more... Um, 
interesting argument really to develop. Okay, so then let's move it on to uh, some of the potential labor questions. Okay, labor doesn't feature it every year. Now, of course, we always get a theory of the firm question. We always get a market failure question. So what do we see here with uh, potential chance for labor? Well, it could be something about the living wage, which is effectively a minimum wage for over 25s. Uh, okay, will naturally result in an increase in unemployment. Okay, so evaluate this statement. It, it could be something along those lines. It could be uh, something to do with really high minimum wages that Labour has actually touted. Uh, okay, so when it comes to high minimum wages, um, to what extent will they actually um, really damage uh, opp employment opportunities for uh, various people in various different markets. I mean, you go into any McDonald's now, of course, you can see the way in which they've managed to substitute labour for capital because now you don't place your order with a person, you place it on one of those touch screen things, okay? So, you know, that's a really interesting point there. Clearly, they want, these big firms want to continue to substitute labour uh, for capital when it's effective for them to do so and when the technology is right. So that's an important context to actually use in any sort of minimum wage question. Uh, okay, and then alternatively, it may focus on sort of trade unions. Okay, we had one on wage differentials last year, so I think that's less likely to appear. Uh, okay, so trade unions offer improved wages and greater employee motivation, therefore, they are always desirable. So, evaluate the statement. Um, so this is another uh, interesting argument that you can have here. And both of these two questions on the labor economics, they're really going to consider much the same sort of diagram, but just slightly different labeling of them, of course. Okay, and now let's have a look at uh, some other titles. Um, so um, nationalization, privatization has been in the news quite a bit over the last few years because, of course, um, the, the socialist government, uh, not government, but uh, opposing party, rather, of uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, has been touting various um, nationalization policies of uh, water and rail. Uh, okay, so the, there's a really interesting argument to be had about where privatization has worked, where it hasn't. Uh, so, I mean, look at these colors I'm using here. What brand does this remind you of? Uh, maybe EasyJet? Uh, now, the airline market is, of course, a sector where privatisation has been enormously successful, um, but certain other areas haven't been quite as successful. Some argue that the, the uh, privatisation policies haven't actually been thorough enough in industries such as rail and industries such as uh, the energy markets, where prices were falling quite dramatically in the early 2000s, but have risen um, considerably over the last sort of five to 10 years. Uh, so that's also another interesting point. When it comes to uh, nationalization, just excuse the uh, cuckoo clock, which my kids love that. Uh, okay, so uh, when it comes to uh, nationalization, um, now, of course, we know the government can, uh, and public bodies can generate enormous economies of scale. And for natural monopolies, this, this may be uh, appropriate, of course, where you can't still actually exploit all of the available economies of scale. So uh, that's, that's also an interesting point. And we've also got to consider the need for deregulation at the same time as privatisation. Um, now, when it comes to nationalization of uh, the rail sector, another interesting argument there is that it tends to be more affluent people that actually travel by train into these big urban centers for their daily commute. So to what extent do those people really need a uh, subsidy? Are we just sort of subsidizing upper middle classes if we simply nationalize uh, the train sector? Anyway, uh, next one, well, elasticities. Uh, I think it was about 2012 maybe since uh, we last saw a question on elasticities. Um, now, this could fit with something under uh, the reams of uh, price discrimination here as well uh, and how companies like EasyJet 
and they use price discrimination according to different flight times and uh, different passengers paying different amounts depending on when they booked okay so that's a, a really interesting point I mean right now EasyJet have been criticized for the actual price of flights to Madrid ahead of the Champions League final uh, I looked the other day to go and see uh, the England Italy rugby in March next year um, so for uh, the four of us to fly out two and a half thousand pounds like what is effectively what an hour and a quarter flight hour and a half flight or so um, okay so yeah um, any other time you'd be able to fly out to Rome for about 200 quid for the four of us and back so um, yeah really interesting uh, elasticity is of course massively important and that is price income and cross elasticities of demand firms need to be aware of these points so uh yeah really big stuff there guys okay make sure you're sharp on these there's a good chance we might see elasticities and if it's not here this year well i think it's a cert for next year okay great stuff guys i wish you all the best i'll uh, upload the uh, macro uh copy of this uh, video very shortly all the best